بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما So today, inshallah, we talk about tawbah. So we've been talking about mindfulness, dhikr, developing a relationship with Allah, and taking a daily inventory, looking inwards. And it's helpful to keep those as goals, but recognize that at times we may fall short, and in times we may wax and wane in our motivation. Sometimes we hit the target, sometimes we don't, but it's important to have a process of returning to our goals. And tawbah in the, in the linguistic sense, Tawbah is derived from Taba Yatubu, which means to return to something. And so having this concept of having goals and not being afraid to make mistakes and learn from them and return to having those goals, not becoming so demoralized by our mistakes that we don't return to having those, uh, return to our lofty goals. And so essentially, we're going to talk about toba, why it's important, but specifically, we're going to talk about some specific concepts like, what do we do when the thought comes into our mind that, well, I don't think I can stop my habit, should I still make toba? Um, and Imam al-Ghazali gives us a lot of great advice on that. So we're going to learn from that. And then the third one is, that comes up often, I heard it this week, I'm too bad to come back. Like, I'm not... You don't understand how bad I am or what I've done. Um, so we're, we'll address that too. There's a story in the hadith that we'll learn from to really clarify what does that mean. And then inshallah, we'll talk a little bit about what toba is, how to make it. So, so let's start. What is toba? So we talked that it means to, uh, linguistically means to return to something. So what are the benefits of toba? So basically, toba, repentance, the benefit is forgiveness of the long-lasting effects, so removing the long-lasting effects of our actions, our behavior. So we're responsible for our actions in the next world. So toba being a mechanism to fix that. But then also, more immediately, when we engage in unhealthy behaviors or behaviors that are sinful, a black dot comes on our heart, our heart, nukta soda. And if we make toba, then that gets removed. It comes in uh, many different books of hadith. If we make toba, that dot gets removed. And so to number one, remove the long lasting effects, but then short acting effects. So that's the number, uh, that's one benefit. The second benefit is as we start talking about developing a relationship with Allah and spirituality, Allah loves those who turn back to him. So it says in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. So Allah loves the people who make tawbah. And here it's tawabin. It's people who repeatedly turn back to him. So again, the, the goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to be better than our previous selves and consistently turn back to Allah for forgiveness. Okay, and then there is a, so we know that Allah loves tawbah. And in the Quran, it talks about many things Allah loves. So how much does Allah love tawbah? Like, what is the explanation of that? So it, there's a hadith Imam Muslim collects. He said, basically it says, Verily, Allah is more pleased with the repentance of his slave. This is in Riyadh al-Salihin in the chapter of Tawbah. It's a hadith collected by Imam Muslim and in the compilation of Imam al nawawi Verily, Allah is more pleased with the repentance of his slave than a person who has his camel in a waterless desert, carrying his provision of food and drink, and it's lost. Having lost all hopes to get it back, he lies down in the shade and is disappointed about his camel. All of a sudden, he finds the camel standing before him. So just to kind of bring it back, because I think this is hard to really understand, because this is a situation of a man who lost his camel in a waterless desert, 
the camel has all its provisions on it. So this means death. This is hard to understand it, perhaps in our modern context, because it's really, it's hard to find a place where you can't just walk to or drive to in order to get drink or food. So imagine another situation, let's say skydiving. You jumped out, you jumped out of the plane. Your parachute is your lifeline. You're in the middle of your dive. Too far from the plane uh, for any help, uh, if, if help could even be had at that point. And you're in the middle between the plane and the ground. And your parachute fails you. And you, you're sort of resigned to what's about to happen. So you close your eyes. And you're just expecting impact. And then all of a sudden, the parachute tugs on you. The example here is an example of how happy you would be once you realize that you're going to be saved. Like that feeling of desperation, midair, parachutes failed, I'm going to die, basically. And then resigning to that, and then all of a sudden, parachute goes off. And that intense happiness. So back to the hadith, all of a sudden he finds his camel because again, in that context, that camel was his lifeline. It's certain death. His camel went off with his food and drink and he takes hold of its reins and out of joy, he blurts out, Oh Allah, you are my slave and I'm your rub. So he gets it wrong. He commits this mistake out of his extreme joy. In other words, he's so joyful. He doesn't even know what he's saying. So that's the joy. And that's the, type of welcome we get to make tawbah. So Allah loves tawbah. So we get this forgiveness and this ability to wipe away our deeds, wipe our slate clean. And then it's something that Allah loves. So then the question comes that people have is, I don't think I can stop my habit. I have an addictive habit. I keep going back to it. Should I still make tawbah? And let's just put away our assumptions, our thoughts, our reasoning, our understanding. Let's look at what Imam al-Ghazali teaches us in Minhaj, Minhaj al-Abidin in the chapter of Tawbah. He has a chapter on Tawbah. And let's just read it. Because Imam al-Ghazali is, is authority. We're going to appeal to authority, not only in talking about spiritual matters, but also in Islamic law. And in, in many different Islamic sciences. Okay, so it says, if you say, now this is Imam al-Ghazali teaching us, if you say the only thing that is preventing me from Tawbah, so basically in this chapter, he talks about Tawbah and he talks about all these things that prevent people from making Tawbah. And this is one of those things that he says that people often say prevent them from Tawbah. So he says, if you say the only thing that's preventing me from Tawbah is that I know about myself, that I'll return to this sin, and I will not be able to commit to my Tawbah. So what's the benefit of even making Tawbah? Does that make sense? So basically, Imam al-Ghazali is saying, if you're this person who says, I'm not going to make Tawbah because I know I'm just going to return. So what's the point? So Imam al-Ghazali gives us the advice. He says, you should know that this idea that you have is a deception of shaitan. First of all, he says, you should know that, that this is a deception of shaitan. And where are you getting this knowledge from, is what he says, that you'll return to your sin. Where are you getting this knowledge from? It's possible you'll die before that. You'll die as someone who has returned to who has returned and made tawbah before you return to your behavior, before you return to your sin. So he says, know that this is a deception of shaitan, number one. And then number two, he says, as for your fear that you'll return, your responsibility is resolve and sincerity. That's all, you know, the fact that you're, you're afraid that you're going to return to your sin or your behavior, all you need to worry about is having resolve and sincerity 
in your tawbah. That's your, our responsibility. And upon Allah is the outcome. So either you get the outcome and succeed, so you, you, you get the outcome, which is breaking your habit and succeed, or you don't get the outcome and your previous sin was forgiven and you're purified of it. And all that you accrue is the sin that you just did. Does that make sense? Okay, so basically he's saying this idea that you have that's preventing you from making tawbah every time you go back to your habit, that what's the point of even making tawbah? Because I'm just going to go back to the sin. He said that's a deception of shaitan. It's a trick. Don't fall for it. Because how do you know you'll return to it? Uh, how do you know you're going to return to it after your tawbah? And then he says, look, it's a win-win situation. There's a benefit of it. Either you make tawbah, you resolve to not go back to your habit and you succeed. So you break your habit, you make tawbah, and you move forward. Or you go back to your habit and all your previous sin, your previous sin was forgiven because you made tawbah and you're purified of it. And all that you accrue is the sin that you just did. And then he says, this is a great profit and benefit. This is a great profit and benefit. Then he goes on to say, if you make toba and you breach that toba, so you've made toba now and you've gone back to your sin. If you make toba and you go back to your behavior a second time, then what he says is return to your toba immediately. Immediately, he says, and say to yourself, it's possible that I'll die before I return to this sin again. So I should make toba and go through that process again. So not only does he say go to it immediately, he gives us a, a medicine. He gives us a, a, something to tell ourselves so we can rectify that illogical belief that there's no point in toba. He says, say to yourself, it's possible that I'll die before I return to this sin again. So I'd rather do that with a toba in my record as opposed to without it. And then he says, this is beautiful. He just bottom lines it, makes it very simple. He says, just like you take the unhealthy behavior, the sin, and returning to it as a habit, you should make toba and also make toba and returning to your toba as a habit. So, so bottom line, just like it, it, we have an addictive habit, with that we should add to that this habit of making toba. And he said, don't be more lax in your toba than in your sinning, in your habit. And don't despair. And don't let shaitan prevent you from toba with that reason. So, you know, I thought this was so enlightening, number one, because who it's coming from. And number two, you know, it's intuitive to feel like there's no benefit here. Why should I make tawbah? Let me fix everything first and then return back to Allah. But here Imam Al-Ghazali is teaching us, no, don't take that route. It's a deception. And to make a habit out of making tawbah and returning because Allah is most merciful. All right. So the second question that comes up is about tawbah is, I'm too bad to make toba. Like, no, no, you don't understand. I've been doing this for 30 years. Or you don't understand the type of addicted habit that I have. Um, or you don't understand I'm unique or some exceptional in some way. And, that, and that's problematic because it's almost as if we're saying, no, no, my sin can overpower the mercy of Allah. No, no, I have an exceptional issue. And we go to the Quran first to understand this. So Surah uh, uh, Zumar, uh, Allah says, قُلْ يَا إِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ ذُنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah says, say to my slaves, those who have 
who've gone in excess against themselves, don't despair from the mercy of Allah. Verily Allah forgives all sins. Not, it doesn't say verily Allah forgives sins. He says he forgives all sins. Verily he is the most merciful. Innahu huwa ghafoor ar-Rahim. So here Allah is saying, don't despair from the mercy of Allah. He forgives all sins. So when we think about the addictive habit that we're in, we simply have to think about, is this a sin? Is this a, an unhealthy habit? And if it is, then Allah forgives it. If, is this an unhealthy habit? If it is, Allah forgives it. So, so it's, it, it doesn't matter if it's a sin that society deems is wrong. It doesn't matter if it's a sin that, you know, my social group is really strongly against. The, the question is, is, is it a sin? Is it from the category of sin that Allah forgives? So then we, again, we go to the, to the hadith to, to understand this. And in the same uh, chapter of Tawbah in, in Riyadh al-Salihin, uh, there's a hadith. And I'll, I'll summarize it because I don't want this to get too lengthy, but it was basically a story of the man from the, a nation before you. And this is a man who murdered 99 people. You know this story? Do we know this story? Okay. And we've mentioned it here before. Okay. And we've mentioned it here before. A man murders 99 people. And the, the point that I want to get across is he had this question. He said, is there any chance for Toba for me? Because this was his question. He said, look, I get, we're saying there's this Toba thing, but look at my situation. It might be a little bit unique. So let me try to explain to you what my situation is. And he says, he murdered 99 people. The first person that answered him said, no, you don't have any Toba. And he murdered him to make it 100. And then he went to a person of knowledge. He went to a person of knowledge and he finds out, of course, there's chance for Toba for me. And then he goes on a quest and he goes out and he sets out to rectify his behavior. And he dies along the way. But before that, he made Toba. And the Toba was successful because he got the mercy of Allah. So if we ever have this like doubt, like, is my sin or is my problem my addictive habit too bad is it going to overpower the mercy of allah if you're a believer islam and this is something that you're worried about sin and not being able to get the mercy of allah then know that in the quran the teaching of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam there is a teaching of this that you are you have the ability to make Toba and come back. So, all right. So then that, that sort of settles that. So that, that question of like, oh no, you don't understand my particular sin. You know, we can sort of derive strength from this to really understand not what my understanding is or what my assumptions are. This is, this is a specific sin that my social group or society deems is wrong, which of course is a moving goalpost, right? Cannabis one a uh, year is, um, has a penalty of incarceration. Another year, it's, it's not. It's actually something that you can prescribe medically and it's legal. Um, so we don't look at like, what is this sin that it's not, I'm not the measure of if this sin is too big or not. We put that towards um, Allah and his messenger. Okay, all right. And finally, we'll wrap up with, there are conditions for Toba. Well, how do you make Toba? So the conditions, Imam al nawi in Riyadh al-Salihin in his chapter of Toba, he talks about this in the beginning of that chapter, that the ulama said there's conditions for Toba. So the first condition of Toba is to abstain from the sin, to abstain from the behavior. Number two is to have a sense of feeling bad over it, regret over it. So it's not something that you just now say you've done and now you sort of glamorize it or tell war stories about it it's something you feel bad about and then 
have a sincere resolve not to go back to it again. So those are the three conditions. And that third condition, having a resolve not to go back to it again, is just that. You don't need to have absolute certainty of the future that you'll be successful. You need to have resolve and confidence in the moment in your ability to go back to it. And this is something we do with motivational enhancement counseling. We ask people this question on a scale of one to 10, how motivated, or I'm sorry, how confident are you in your ability to stay abstinent? And say that person says, I'm a six out of 10. Then we explore in the counseling books, it says, then explore. What is it going to take to go from a six out of 10 to a 10 out of 10? And then that person says, well, you know, if I did this counseling, or maybe if I put this software on my computer, or maybe if I um, checked into rehab, or maybe if I did this program to help uh, manage my weight or whatever it is, then I'll feel a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10, and I'll feel confident. So that third condition, having this azam, this resolve not to go back to it, we have to think in our own minds, what do I need to add this time? And this is the point that I would get across that I have in conversations on a daily basis. When we do have people that relapse into their behavior, that's the question we have. What, what was your longest period of abstinence? How did you achieve that? And what can we add this time to give you the confidence that you'll be able to make it this time? So having a resolve not to commit, it, to, to go back to that behavior, part of that is being honest with ourselves of what do I need to add to my box of tools in order to be able to be confident in my ability to stop this time? Okay, so that's uh, Toba. There's a fourth condition if there was, if we've harmed other people, which is to return the rights of anybody that we harm. So a simple example is if we've taken somebody else's property to return that property. And uh, keep in mind, if, uh, if, if that becomes dangerous, then you want to ask somebody for their feedback. Is this something that makes sense for me to do? Or is this going to put myself or that person in danger? So if you, if you, you know, rob somebody, and by returning that property to them, you're putting yourself, your family, or your community in danger, because a conflict might happen, then maybe that's not something you should do. And you should talk to somebody, maybe your uh, local imam, or talk to somebody you trust, with some knowledge who can help you navigate that situation. So that's, that's Toba. And that's something that, if properly understood, it can really help us have a compassionate understanding of how to move forward. Because the last thing we wanna do is, the opposite of that is to not practice any tools to change our habit. And then when we engage in our habit, just sit there and beat ourselves up. I'm the worst person in the world. Um, there's no coming back from this and have no hope. The opposite of that is taking a practice, learning about how to break the habit, adding a tool each time we fall off and then returning to Allah and making Toba and recognizing, although we may not be able to forgive ourselves, Allah is the most forgiving. And just like he's beyond our comprehension and everything else, it, when it comes to forgiveness, that also holds true. So now we're going to go to the book, page 138, exercise 7.2. We've been talking about mindfulness and how studies show that uh, mindfulness is very helpful for addiction and breaking addictive habits. So exercise 7.2 talks about bringing mindfulness practice into your daily life. And it says, practice being present and aware as you do each of the activities below. So it talks about daily activities like taking a shower, waking up in the morning, eating uh, mindfully, walking mindfully, so on and so forth. Because if you're able to bring mindfulness into your routine mundane activities that are usually subconscious, by the way, like eating, waking up, brushing your teeth, showering, um, going to sleep, these are usually subconscious behaviors. If we're able to bring mindfulness into these subconscious behaviors, 
to bring consciousness to them, then we're able to practice that focus and then bring that into our addictive behaviors. When we start to subconsciously become preoccupied with our addictive behavior or have cravings to engage in our addictive behavior, so on and so forth. So what it says, and this is important, after you complete each exercise, ask yourself some questions about it. So after you bring mindfulness into each element of your daily routine, because what it goes into this exercise is take a mindful shower, take a mind, eat mindfully, so on and so forth. What it's saying though is after you complete being mindful in those events, ask yourself some questions about it. What did you experience? How did that feel? What did you notice? How was that activity different when you bring mindfulness into it as opposed to when you didn't bring mindfulness into it? And there are, sure, you can just sort of become aware of the present moment without any prompting, but you can also bring a sort of grateful mindfulness into the moment. So when you eat, being grateful for the food and appreciating the food. And in our tradition, the Prophet وسلم, he made dhikr with every activity that he did, every, everything that was going on through the day. So there's a, a dhikr and a dua that he made when he woke up. There's a dhikr and dua that he made uh, when he went to the bathroom, when he came out of the bathroom, uh, when he took a shower, before wudu, before he ate, after he ate, before he went to sleep, and so on and so forth. And, and the dhikr is, would be a remembrance of Allah, but it would capture elements of each activity and bring gratitude to it. Um, so it would, um, when he would wear his clothes, he would say, all praise and gratitude is for the one who has clothed me. So then it, it brings this mindfulness to the wearing of the clothes, but then also a gratitude and connecting that event to the present moment and also to Allah. So when we do exercise 7.2, you can read through it and talk about how they bring mindfulness into these different activities, but then also recognize that we can also integrate aspects of our tradition, which would essentially be bringing those dhikrs before you eat, after you eat, before you wear your clothes, so on and so forth, and then being mindful of that activity as a blessing from Allah. And with that, when you bring gratitude, it's like putting sugar on top. So when you eat, you put a little salt, pepper on top. And then when you make dhikr and mindfulness, you put some sugar on top because you're able to really appreciate it and be grateful for it. And it makes it more visceral. So, and then there's the wrap up, which I'm going to go to, and then we'll finish this chapter and we'll have another chapter afterwards that we'll go into. Um, there's a section on acceptance. And then there's a section on compassion and kindness. And it says an important piece, which says kindness and compassion are both characteristics that can enable you to practice mindfulness. So if we're making a dhikr of Allah and we do something that we feel bad about, making tawbah is a way to fix that connection so we can continue to make dhikr of Allah and utilize that connection in order to um, stay strong in our um, practice. Uh, and then it goes into the wrap up. In this chapter, you had the opportunity to learn about what mindfulness is and how to develop a practice of mindfulness and how that can be helpful in your recovery. And it goes to say more things and then and it gives a preview of the next chapter. And the next chapter, you're going to find ways to increase joy, pleasure, and fulfillment in your life with mindfulness skills in your back pocket, you will be able to experience these positive emotions at a deeper level. Um, so inshallah, with that, we will um, wrap up. Any questions for doing some service in the community, if we're helping other people, 
if we're doing other good deeds, we shouldn't say, oh, I've relapsed or I'm engaging in this addictive habit. I should give up that other good activity. Rather, we should continue those good activities, continue accruing those good deeds and increase in them, and can then continue working on this project of breaking our addictive habit. And, you know, what I was hoping to get across is that we shouldn't let that trick of shaitan separate us from continuing to work on connecting with Allah and continuing to engage in good behavior and good have and good deeds and all the other amazing things that we're doing. Um, and we'll end with this hadith that was uh, related by Imam Tirmidhi, where it says, this is a hadith Qudsi. I heard the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Allah the Almighty said, O son of Adam, so long as you call upon me and ask me, I shall forgive you for what you have done and I shall not mind. O son of Adam, were your sins to reach the clouds of the sky and you were then to ask forgiveness of me, I would forgive you. O son of Adam, were you to come to me with sins nearly as great as the earth and were you then to face me, ascribing no partner to me, I would bring you forgiveness nearly as great as it 